the pre-recorded uh, video, so now we will uh, have the video. So thank you again. Hello, my name is Roy Cassiano. I'm professor and vice chairman and director of the Rhinology and Endoscopic Skull Base Program at the Department of Oral Laryngology at the University of Miami. Uh, and I want to thank the organizing uh, committee, uh, Dr. Falkins and uh, everyone else uh, there and at the uh, European Rhinologic Society for uh, the invitation uh, to present a talk. I'm sorry I can't be there with you. Unfortunately, the circumstances don't allow, but I sure hope to be there with you in, in the future. These are my disclosures. None of them have any conflict with uh, today's talk. So this is the ventral view of the sphenoid bone. Uh, and we're gonna focus on the, the anatomy a little bit in reference to uh, nasal pharyngectomy. What's important for uh, understanding the anatomy for nasal pharyngectomy is that the pterygoid bone itself becomes a very critical landmark, whether you're operating in the nasal pharynx or in the, in the case above that blue line, but below the red line, you're working in the infratemporal fossa. If you go lateral to the lateral pterygoid plate, you will be in the peripharyngeal space. And, and the main structures there are gonna be the lateral uh, pterygoid muscle. And then further out, it's gonna be uh, neurovascular uh, bundles and uh, the, uh, the peripharyngeal carotid artery coursing downward. Medial to the medial pterygoid plate, uh, then you have the uh, eustachian tube to opening, which is directly behind it. And then the rest of the nasal pharynx, which is medial to it. So looking at it from a CT perspective, again, the blue square is the area we're not going to uh, talk about today, but these are the structures relative to the bony base of the pterygoid bone. Inferiorly, we see the lateral and medial pterygoid plate. Uh, what is between the lateral and medial pterygoid plate is going to be the medial pterygoid muscle. Uh, and, and, and posterior to that is going to be the tensor palatini uh, muscle that courses underneath the hamulus and over into the soft palate. Lateral to the ter lateral pterygoid plate is going to be the peripharyngeal space uh, with the carotid artery. And then posterior to these plates uh, and, and, and is going to be the eustachian tube coursing towards from the cartilaginous portion, coursing to the osseous portion. And posterior to that eustachian tube is going to be the longus capitis muscle. So here's a, just a diagram endoscopically uh, of what we see. We see the eustachian tube on the left side, the nasal pharynx just posteriorly here. And in the green, we'll see uh, the medial pterygoid plate. If you remove this mucosa directly in front of the eustachian tube, it's the medial pterygoid plate. And then just below that is gonna be the course of the tensor palatini under the hamulus. In yellow is the area of the palatine bone. This is the horizontal portion or the palatal portion of the palatine bone. And as you look here on the sagittal, you see the, the, both the uh, sphenoid uh, process and the orbital process of the palatine bone in between which is gonna be the sphenopalatine foramen. When we take this bone off, we take this mucosa off and we're able to dissect the palatine bone and the medial pterygoid plate. And when you drill this bone away, you'll enter that space between the lateral and medial pterygoid plate, which uh, en encases the medial pterygoid muscle. Also notice that the direction of the lateral pterygoid plate points uh, indirectly to the area of the carotid artery. So your limits of nasal pharyngectomy are really gonna be uh, the medial aspects of the carotid artery. If the tumor goes beyond it, then you need a different uh, approach, whether it's combined or external. Here's the medial and lateral, or the lateral and medial pterygoid plate. We've got the uh, longus capitis uh, that you see on both sides here. And we've got the inter internal carotid artery at which the lateral pterygoid plate points towards uh, and gives you that orientation. And then you've got all the structures, including the eustachian tube in between that are resected. Oh. So the areas in a typical nasal pharyngectomy are as such, obviously this can be modified depending on the extent of tumor, uh, but this is pretty much the limits of resection. So in a nasal pharyngectomy, a medial maxillectomy of some kind has to be done for exposure and to be able to get instruments and scopes. Uh, this may involve uh, doing a modified endoscopic dankers or even a formal uh, assisted uh, external incision like a Caldwell Luck uh, with the dankers to get way lateral uh, as needed. The uh, inferior transpterygoid plate 
approach uh, uh, it means that you're heading at the level that I just discussed, at the level of the medial and lateral pterygoid plate. Uh, there's resection of the medial pterygoid muscle and the tensor palatini muscle. You want to uh, re uh, resect and develop margins early, at least on the nasal pharyngeal side, uh, uh, and, and dissect the tumor away from the underlying superior constrictor, constrictor and longus coli and capitis muscles. Doesn't mean you have to remove the muscles completely. But we do leave a layer of muscle on the tumor, but we do sample the, the, the muscle for any uh, microscopic margins. Finally, the, the procedure is completed by the transection of the car, uh, bony cartilaginous uh, junction of the eustachian tube and the entire cartilaginous uh, eustachian tube is removed. Endodoppler is very important uh, for us. We don't trust the navigator, especially when you've got a moving tumor as you're, as you're doing the surgery. It moves in orientation to the preoperative MRIs and all the other scans we have. So in, in, in reality, the endodoppler is the most important instrument we have for any uh, neurovascular structure that is, has a tendency to move during surgery. Here's a, a, a case of an endoscopic nasal pharyngectomy in a 55-year-old female followed for over a year for serous otitis media on the, on the right, even had a PE tube by uh, the uh, uh, otologist in the community she was going to. Uh, she came in with a second op opinion and a mass was noted on, on just simple nasal endoscopy. The PAP scan was unremarkable except for the tumor noted in the nasal pharynx. And you can see here on the axial image, this uh, tumor here, which turned out to be on biopsy an adenoid cystic carcinoma. And this is uh, the procedure that was done. You can see again, the, uh, the tumor here on MRI extending all the way, but not quite enc encasing the carotid artery. You can see it here and on coronal. And the first thing we do on this is, uh, is a medial maxillectomy. And then we wanna get around that tumor in the nasal pharynx, we wanna do extended sphenoids. In the end, if we're gonna use a septal flap to reconstruct the raw areas, then we use a left nasal septal flap. So you gotta make sure you uh, uh, take care of the uh, pedicle. So a posterior septectomy is done with an extended sphenoid. We already did the medial maxillectomy. We take the rostrum out. We pr protect the left uh, nasal septal flap uh, pedicle. We do an inferior trans approach. You can see here the greater palatine nerve that we were just reflecting. Rarely are we able to reserve that when we do a nasal pharyngectomy. We were doing that mostly for, for an exercise just to show it there. But we, uh, we at this point, we uh, do a modified dankers by uh, bringing down some of the bone, just a little bit enough to get uh, our instruments and our scopes into the maxillary sinus. And we've done a medial maxillectomy. We basically uh, drill down the palatine bone and the medial pterygoid plate. And then we go around the tumor and the nasal pharynx to reflect it uh, uh, to the right, uh, away from the opposite, from the midline, the opposite eustachian tube. Uh, we uh, cut all the paraspinal muscles and reflect the eustachian tube anteriorly, as you can see here, as we're cutting. We can use a, a suction bovi or any other bovi to reflect it. We leave a cuff of muscle on the, on the eustachian tube and the tumor. And then we uh, detach the uh, eustachian tube from its bony, marge, uh, bony uh, uh, junction. Uh, and then we complete separating the, the tumor and the eustachian tube complex from the underlying longus capitis muscle. All of this, we do biopsies and frozen sections carefully. Finally, we do the final resection. We even use a microdebreeder that you can do to cut and dissect. As you're down here in this area, you gotta be careful you don't overstretch the palate or you'll have a palatal fistula that you may have to deal with with a obturator temporarily until it gets reconstructed. Sometimes it's necessary if the tumor goes inferiorly. So we complete the dissection and we have this wound that could basically be left alone to heal by secondary intention, or it could be just reconstructed as in this case with a contralateral nasal fl septal flap, as you see there, followed by some gel foam and then a Maricel tampon. So here is the pre-op and the post-op of the uh, nasal pharyngectomy. You actually can see the flap laying 
in its place here. And the patient's been free of disease uh, for over five years now. Case two, this is a 67-year-old uh, who uh, is satisposed by lateral maxillary and ethmoid surgery for polyps. During the surgery, the per surgeon noticed enlarged uh, adenoid bed, which was biopsy and resulted in adenocarcinoma. It was uh, reconfirmed as low-grade adenocarcinoma at our tumor, uh, uh, our path uh, pathologist. And a PET scan showed increased uptake, again, only in the nasal pharynx. Uh, Preoperative balloon occlusion was, uh, was done, as many of these tumors. We do these on all of these tumors. And it was negative. It had good contralateral flow. So we feel a little more comfortable in the event that you have to uh, uh, ligate or clip the, the carotid artery during the case. So here is the case. Uh, this is the pre-op here. And, uh, on, on this side, you can see the post-op here. Uh, and likewise, it's a medial maxillectomy. We, uh, in this case, we, we drill again, the medial pterygoid plate, the palatine bone, we dissect the eustachian tube complex and surrounding nasal pharynx uh, off the uh, longus capitis uh, muscle. In this case, there's a little uh, vidian nerve and bleeding there. So we dissect the tumor and any bone around it. Here, we're just cutting some of the longus capitis with a microdebreeder and, and cauterizing as needed. Surprisingly, it really doesn't bleed as, as much as one would think. Uh, even when you use the microdebreeder, you can use it to deflect the tumor and the eustachian tube medial or uh, laterally first as we get the nasopharyngeal margins. And then we uh, cut it uh, laterally away from the bony cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube to complete the, uh, the actual resection. Here you see the carotid artery has been reflected off the carotid artery and it looks like it has a nice layer where you're able to just reflect the tumor off the uh, peripharyngeal carotid artery. So we didn't have to clip it or resect it. And then we get frozen sections from all the areas when, uh, when, it's, uh, when we get the tumor out. That's the longest capitis. You see the carotid. You see the rest of the peripharyngeal soft tissues. We're able to remove the tumor with a cuff of muscle that you can see on top of it all the way to the bony eustachian tube and all the way medial to the nasal pharyngeal margins to get this kind of, of resection. This is just a further follow-up. This is about four years down the road. And again, this is uh, the extent of, of resection. Now, what I showed you were uh, tumors that were very amenable to this kind of surgery, but what do you do for the pure squamous cell type carcinoma or the, un or the poorly differentiated nasal pharyngeal carcinomas. And there have been reports uh, of, its, of its utility, particularly in the recurrent uh, tumors, uh, such as in this study where they, uh, they uh, went back after radiation therapy on the radiation therapy failures with limited extent uh, to the nasal pharynx and maybe into the eustachian tube, we were able to get around it and resect this area with a two-year overall survival rate and local relapse-free survival rate and progression-free survival rate at, uh, in the 80s. So that's not a bad result for uh, irradiated uh, nasal pharyngeal carcinomas that recur. This is uh, a, the, uh, end, a, a report on endonasal pharyngectomy for carcinoma. In this case, there were only 12 patients, follow-up for 44 months, five-year follow-up, Overall survival, about 50%, uh, and disease-specific survival, about 58%, with no severe complications uh, and, and no independent prognostic factors for survival outcomes were identified. So the things to look out for, potential complications, include uh, peripharyngeal sympathetic plexus or carotid artery injury. You have to be prepared to deal with this uh, and have the staff and the OR uh, available in case of any uh, injury to the carotid artery. Uh, it's better to be prepared with, with preoperative uh, uh, balloon occlusion to make sure that you've got contralateral flow. If you don't have contralateral flow, that, then that poses a bigger problem that you may have to consult your vascular surgeons or your neurosurgeons. Speech and swallowing rehabilitation may be necessary depending on the degree of of, uh, of soft palate resection. If you do that, most of the time, you don't need to do that for a nasal pharyngectomy. You certainly may have to resect some uh, lateral pterygoid muscle, uh, and that may lead to progressive amounts of trismus needing rehabilitation. 
And of course, if you have to go up into the uh, infratemporal fossa and middle cranial fossa as well, uh, there may be a CSF leak you may have to contend with and repair. There is also risk to both the branches of V3 as well as V2. Thank you. So thank you everyone. We are a little bit late, so uh, there is some uh, lunch time. I'm sorry.